Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Rachel Belmer, the museum's director of membership. And I'm so excited to welcome you to today's member art break with Catherine Sawinski, the museum's assistant curator of European art as she discusses the upcoming exhibition, First Impressions, Early Printed Books in Europe. But before we get things started today, we wanna to take a moment to say thank you. As members, you play such a vital role in supporting and shaping the future of the museum. And I truly cannot overstate how much of a positive impact you make on our institution. So on behalf of our entire Milwaukee Art Museum team, thank you. And then before I turn things over to Catherine today, I did quickly wanna go over our program format. You will see that the chat feature is enabled below and we'll use that to help any questions that you have at the end of Catherine's presentation. Um, my colleague, Amy Kirschke, who's the museum's director of adult, docent and school programs is gonna help facilitate the questions and answers, um, but feel, please feel free to add questions as we go and then we'll do our best to answer those at the end and then see what discussion comes from those. And then I did want to make special note to watch out for a very special member email announcement coming out tomorrow, where Marcel Poludnik, the museum's Donna and Donald Baumgartner director, will be sharing the reopening date for the museum's mezzanine level, as well as our second floor galleries, which is where the exhibition Catherine will be discussing today is located. Um, so that wait is almost over and we are so excited to share that news with our members first. And then finally, Elizabeth Gasparka, the museum's development officer for membership, someone I know many of you know well, will be closing things out today. So with that, I think we are ready to get started. And I'm so pleased to introduce you to our fabulous presenter today, Catherine Sawinski, the Milwaukee Art Museum's assistant curator of American art. Catherine has been the assistant curator of European art at the Milwaukee Art Museum since 2008. She joined the museum staff in 2001. The exhibitions she has curated include Intimate Images of Love and Loss, Portrait Miniatures in 2010, The Temple of Flora in 2017, and The Art of Devotion Illuminated Manuscripts from Local Collections in 2019. She has also assisted with organizing 17 exhibitions, including Bouguereau in America in 2019. Catherine is charged with researching the museum's collection of ancient and European artworks before 1900 and regularly writes for the museum's blog. Catherine has an MA in art history with two certificates in museum studies from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and a BA in art history and classics from Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. So with that, um, please join me in welcoming Catherine Sawinski. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so I will forward to my first slide and actually um, start off by saying, um, if you can think back two years, and I know that seems like ancient history now, but um, if you uh, were keeping up with what we were doing in the European department back then, uh, you may have remembered the exhibition on illuminated manuscripts that I was able to put together uh, so the show was actually uh, well received and um, was kind of a surprise, not totally to me, that people were really interested in hand seeing handwritten pages from the Middle Ages and early Renaissance. So uh, just to give you a little uh, behind the scenes uh, look at um, how that came about, when I first wanted to do that show, I thought that it would actually include both illuminated manuscripts and early printed books in the same exhibition. Uh, but quickly became clear as I contacted uh, local collections that we had plenty of manuscript material to do a whole exhibition just on that. So because of that, uh, that means that I could save the early printed material for this exhibition. So this is actually really exciting. We have a great assortment of things in um, our collection at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Uh, actually, this time, almost every single thing you'll see in the gallery is owned by, um, by the museum. So the title of the exhibition is a little punny. I love puns, if anybody knows me, so hopefully you don't find it too annoying. Uh, First Impressions, Early Printed Books in Europe. And it's, um, like Rachel mentioned, scheduled to open when the second floor of the museum reopens um, and uh, uh, um, shortly. The show will actually explore the art and context of early printed books. So uh, if you'd ask me, well, what exactly does it entail? 
Uh, for my purposes, this will be the first century after the introduction of the printing press in Europe, which is roughly 1450 to 1550. So the development of the printing press in mid 15th century Germany revolutionized the production and dissemination of the written word. No longer dependent on time consuming handwritten manuscripts, communication went through a major transformation. And just to give you a sense of what this entailed, here I'm showing you on the left an illustration from an illuminated manuscript showing a monk teaching other monks how to handwrite a manuscript. While on the right, there are two men working on a hand press to print multiple copies of a book. So you can see that whereas before it would be very time consuming, two men on the right hand with a hand press could produce books much faster. So this transition is much like the introduction of new forms of communication in our own time, uh, from things such as the fax machine, if anybody is old enough to remember those, to email and the internet, to smartphones. This comparison hopefully helps put this revolution of printing um, into a context that we can easily understand today. But just as our modern technology required the right combination of people, ideas, and economics to come to fruition, so too did printing almost 600 years ago. So what were some of the elements that were needed? One example is something that we today probably don't think of as something called a technology, the development of papermaking. So true paper is a thin sheet made from fiber that has been macerated until each filament is a separate unit. These uh, matted fibers intertwine to create a strong, flexible mat. So if you've ever been able to um, feel old paper, you probably think that it kind of reminds you of the feel of fabric. And this isn't a mistake. That's because up until the late 18th century, paper was made with linen fibers and sometimes hemp fibers that originally had been clothing. And then from the late 18th to the later 19th century, paper often had cotton in it as well. It's no coincidence that paper was called rag paper. You can even wash rag paper with, with printing on it. Today, most paper is made from wood fibers, which is more fragile. The fibers are shorter and less flexible than in linen, hemp, and cotton. Um, this paper that's made from trees is also, uh, has also higher acidity levels, making the paper age quickly, becoming brittle and discolored, which if you have old books or old newsprint, you know, um, is very common. So old paper has a, a distinctive texture in its weave where there are ridges that you can actually feel. If you hold a page up to the light, like I'm showing you here in the photo on the right, you can actually see small lines in one direction and larger lines going in the other direction. This is because uh, the paper is made in a mold consisting of a wooden frame with a metal grid. The wet slurry of fibers are pressed into the mold, leaving the marks of the metal behind. The heavier lines are called chain lines, which are thicker wires to which the inner laid wires are tied. This kind of paper is therefore often also called laid paper. Paper making was developed by AD 105 in China and then spread through Japan and Korea. It eventually came to the Muslim world through the Silk Road. It was through contacts with Muslim traders that paper began to be imported slowly into Europe by the 11th century. But paper was not used very much because it cost more and was less durable than parchment, usually called vellum, which are processed animal skins used for writing. And we saw a lot of vellum in the illuminated manuscript exhibition. The church felt that vellum was more appropriate for the holy role, role of the written word. This mainly stemmed from the association with paper with Muslim culture. In fact, in 1221, the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II issued a decree that any government documents written on paper were invalid. So they took this um, very seriously. The, um, Frederick's decree didn't work, however, and paper was made and used in Europe in the late Middle Ages. When the printing press began to spread, the paper making industry expanded to fill the demand, becoming a craft in itself with highly specialized roles in the workshop, like the one that I'm showing you here. Paper makers had to go through an apprenticeship for training, just like any craft specialty. This does not mean, however, that early printed texts were not made on vellum. There are examples of printed vellum in the exhibition, and here's actually one of the leaps that you'll be able to see in the show. Besides paper making, we have to consider probably the crucial technological development needed for printing, which is movable type. 
Once again, we have to look to China for the first developments. During the Tang Dynasty, which is 618 to 906, the first prints were made from wood blocks, and that is when one piece of wood is carved with both text and illustration. Here I'm showing you a photo of a finished wood block and another man carving one. On the top here is the earliest dated printed book in the world. It's called the Diamond Sutra, and it is in the collection of the British Library. Made from wood blocks and formatted as a scroll, it's a Chinese translation of one of the most important Buddhist textbooks. We know that it's the old dated printed book because it has a date in the text, May 11th, 868, so this is very old. But there's an even older Buddhist printed book in Korea, the Pure Light Dhanra Sutra. Although it doesn't have a date printed in the text, experts have dated this woodblock printed scroll to around 751. A replica of the book, which is here on the bottom of the screen, is on view at the National Museum of Korea. The woodblock technique of printing books was known in Europe by 1400. Um, these kinds of prints were not made on a press, but like in Asia, they were made by rubbing paper placed on top of the pre-inked blocks. Full plate uh, woodblock prints bound together to make books were called block books. Makes sense. Block books were extremely tedious to make, however, since if more than one page had the same element or the same word or the same um, illustration, it required the uh, artisan to carve, carve it over and over. By the early 16th century, after the spread of the printing press and movable type, block books were rarely made. Here I'm showing you two examples of European block books. In contrast to the scrolls of Asian cultures, European books take on the form of a codex, which has individual leaves stacked and then sewn together on one side. What really spurred the development of the printed books, however, as I mentioned before, was movable type. So movable type uses individual pieces that carry a single letter or special character so that pieces can be assembled and reassembled repeatedly. Type could be combined on the page with woodcut illustrations, which could be sent through the printing press at the same time. We have to return to China for the first use of movable type. Developed during the Zong Dynasty at six, uh, excuse me, 960 to 1279, the first movable type was actually made with porcelain. Because printing text in Chinese requires thousands of characters, you, can't, um, re you can really understand that from these pictures that I'm showing you here. It was still an extremely time consuming process, so it wasn't used extensively. Metal movable type was used in China by the 12th century. The earliest extant book printed with metal movable type, um, which I'm showing here on the right, was actually printed in Korea in 1377. So on the other hand, the Roman alphabet, which is used by many languages in Europe, was ideal for the use of movable type. Rather than cases and cases of individual characters, there are multiples of each letter and symbols that fit into a relatively small space, as you can see here in um, the case in the picture. When we start talking about movable type, we have to talk about the one name in history that is probably familiar to you, Johann Gutenberg. So here he is, Johann Gutenberg. He was born in Mainz, Germany around 1397. He trained as a goldsmith and is known to have been experimenting with printing techniques such as movable type by at least 1439. By 1450, Gutenberg had started a printing workshop using movable type with financing from his business partner, Johannes Fust. Building upon the ideas and techniques circulating around his, during his lifetime, he improved and developed a printing press system that would be extremely influential. The most famous result of this venture what is what is commonly known as the Gutenberg Bible. So this uh, um, Gutenberg Bible refers to a large format copy of the Bible in Latin that Gutenberg produced. They were the first full length books printed by movable type in Europe. Less than 50 of them survive today and many of them are incomplete. The one I'm showing you here on the right is in the collection of the Library of Congress. Although there are no examples of the Gutenberg Bible in our exhibition, as much as I'd love to have one, there are objects on display made within only decades of Gutenberg's Bible. They were made in a range of countries, demonstrating the quick spread of the technology from Germany throughout Europe. It makes sense that Gutenberg, a metalsmith, was working on printing technology, since the most precise and durable movable type could be made out of metal. We do, um, oh, excuse me, the last item to making uh, printed books is the printing press itself. Extremely early presses, including Gutenberg's, do not survive, and no plans have been found for them either. 
we don't even really have a description of what Gutenberg's press looked like. We do know, however, that presses like Gutenberg's were adapted from presses used for other materials such as wine, oil, or paper. They look a lot like the ones I'm showing you here because the printing press essentially didn't change until the machine age of the early 19th century. The exhibition will feature a video made by the library at Cambridge University that will explain the entire process of the printing press, of printing on a hand press like what I'm showing you here. It's sometimes called a common press, but I wanna go over some of the uh, bases. Basics. So individual pieces of type are held in a two-part case, which you can see here on the upper left. The person who sets the type is called a compositor, and he pulls the type out by memory so that he doesn't even need to look at the case. Each individual piece of type has a notch on the side that shows where the bottom of the character is. That way the compositor can feel for the right orientation of the piece without having to look at it. You can see that on the individual piece of type at the top. The type is divided by size with the capitals in the top. In other words, the uppercase is capitals and the lowercase has smaller letters. And this is where our terms uppercase and lowercase come from. The compositor then puts sections of text into a form called a composing stick, which you can see at the bottom. This is also the person who adjusts the spaces between words and lines to get the text to fit the page and be readable. The type is then fitted into individual frames that are locked into a metal form called a chase. This lock chase is called a form and um, contains the print that will appear on one side of the page. A different chase will be used to print the second side of the paper. Here we have four pages which will be folded and cut to make what is called a quarto size book, four being quarto in Latin. Latin basically quarto, all quarto means is that you take one piece of paper and cut it into four separate pieces. Next, the chase is put into the press on the press stone and inked with the ink balls. Then a damp piece of paper is put on the fabric covered tympum. The paper needs to be damp because it will lift the ink better. The frisket, which is parchment or paper with holes cut for each page, is flipped over the paper onto the tympum so that the, it protects the margins from ink. The whole thing is then folded again onto the chase onto the press stone. The stone is on a wooden frame that slides under the right side of the press. The pressman pulls the lever that lowers the platen, which is the surface that actually presses the paper onto the type. The screw that moves the platen gives the pressman mechanical advantage to make sure that the pressure is even and hard enough to lift the stinky, sticky ink from the type. Then the press stone is pulled back out of the press and the paper removed so another sheet can be put in. It'll make a lot more sense if you look at the video um, in, the, in the exhibition. So here's a Swiss print from the late 16th century that shows a print workshop at um, busy at work. Usually all copies of one side of the paper were printed, then the chase in the press was changed so that the other side could be done. Then of course the sheets of paper had to be folded, cut, and stacked. Most printers sold their books um, unbound to save costs and also to let the owner decide how they wanted to bind them. I mean, if you had your own library at home, you probably would have all the books bound the same way um, so that it would be a consistent look on your shelves. Based upon the records of the time, as scholars estimate that an average print workshop working 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week, which would have been standard, could make about uh, 2,500 impressions in a day. The technology of printing spread quickly from Germany throughout Europe over the course of a few decades. You may ask who were demanding these books? It would have been a lot of different people, students, scholars, collectors, and those in religious service. And what kind of books were um, being printed? Before um, the printing press, the cost and time required to make books meant that most copied texts were religious texts, since the luxurious creation was considered a form of devotion, not to mention that the church was probably one of the main um, patrons that could afford to have them made. Now, the relatively lower cost of books meant that subjects such as history, science, and literature gained in popularity. In addition, more reading material became available in vernacular languages, such as German, French, and Italian, rather than Latin, which was the official language of the Roman Catholic Church. So the objects in the, uh, the, ex uh, the exhibition illustrate uh, this. So we'll take a quick look at some examples. Most of what is actually on display in the gallery will be individual leaves. In other words, this is a single sheet that has been removed from a book. Um, a leaf refers to the sheet. A page is actually used to describe one side of the leaf. The earliest printed books are often referred to as incunabula. 
incunabula, or sometimes incunables, um, are, is a term used to describe books printed before 1501. First used by scholars in the 17th century, it is a convenient but arbitrary term because there is no clear change to printing for after that date. So you think, what's the big deal about 1501? Really not a whole lot. The word is actually um, just used as a convenient way of saying this is a really, really early book. So um, in, uh, incunabula uh, is Latin for swaddling clothes or cradle. Consequently, it essentially denotes that these books are from the infancy of printing. Incunabula can be interesting to not only see how books developed from handwritten manuscripts, but also how they changed. This leaf, for example, was part of a book of collected works originally attributed to a monk named Thomas Akempis. Published in 1494 in Germany, it was, like most books of the time, based upon earlier manuscript copies. It has a religious subject matter and it is in Latin. So if you put the printed page, which is on the left, side by side with a leaf from an illuminated manuscript from a century earlier, which I'm showing you here now on the right, you can clearly see how the printed text looks like what came before. They both have two columns. They both use a Gothic font. And they both include large colored letters to mark the beginning of new sections. But if you take a closer look at the printed page, you'll see that the red is handwritten tempera added to the page after the text was printed in black ink. Tempera would have been the paint used in manuscripts as well. Early printed pages often show this combination of techniques, most likely to make the pages look familiar. But this printed page has a few elements that immediately point out that we're looking at an example of a printed book. If you look closely at some of the red letters, you'll notice something strange. So here's a detail on the right of one of them. Hiding in the background, you'll see typeset letters. These are actually the guide letters that the printer puts into the text so that the calligrapher knows what letter to add. Sometimes the owner of the book doesn't bother to pay to have these letters added. So you'll see blank areas on the page with a lonely little black letter. And just to give you a sense of what that looks like, this is a digitized version of this book without um, the uh, handwritten letters in it. And you see those tiny little black letters um, where there should be a handwritten one. One of the most notable differences between the printed page and the manuscript page is at the top. Printers and their customers were quick to realize that one of the benefits of printed books was that titles, section headings, and numberings could be easily, easily added to every page. This not only made it easier to reference your own copy of the book a second time, but it also meant that scholars could refer to an edition of a book. And as long as somebody else um, had that same edition, that person could easily find the reference. So even if you lived in a, a different country in a different city, you could both refer to the same um, passage. This is very different from the manuscript tradition, which made reference difficult since individual copies um, varied and had no numbering system. Most early books were not numbered as we do today by page. Rather, they were numbered by folio, which is just another way to refer to a leaf. A folio would have a front and a back side. For instance, the leaf of the book I'm showing you here is folio number 169. You can see that up in the corner with F-O period and then C-L-X-I-X. -X. So they're in Roman numerals, which means that you got to brush up on your Roman numerals if you study early printed books. Believe it or not, some of the earliest incunabula were books on law. Called digests, these texts were compilations of laws, both canon and civil, that had been developed, used, and discussed since the late Middle Ages. The development of universities in the late Middle Ages were, in great part, led by the interest in studying the law codes of the Roman Empire, which had actually been recently rediscovered. The unusual formatting of the page I'm showing you here derives from the conventions developed in handwritten manuscripts when scholars and students would write comments in the margins around the text. Printed books continued this practice, printing the commentary, what are called glosses and summaries in the margins. When the notes are so voluminous that they could easily overwhelm the text and the margins, printer actually, printers have developed new way page layouts. So here, um, the notes surround the text in a balanced visual pl pleasing way. The square kind of in the upper center, that's the original um, law text and everything that borders around it uh, is actually all the commentary uh, and glosses and, uh, and summaries. So it actually takes up more part room on the page than the, the original text does. But it's, it's even though it's very compact, it's uh, very well um, uh, easy to understand and uh, um, you know, readers could follow uh, along quite well. Not easy to lay out as a printer, though. 
Early printed books saw the flourishing of the woodcut as illustration. Woodcuts are perfect for use in the printing press, um, as I mentioned before, since they work under the same principle as type. The higher areas hold the ink, so that would be the color of the ink, and the cutaway areas are the bare paper. One of the greatest printmakers in history was the German Albert Dürer, who began his career by creating illustrations for early printed books. This leaf is exceptional because it features one of the very first prints the Dürer made after finishing his studies. And because our page had not been researched in such a long time, possibly since it was acquired in 1929, we actually didn't have this catalog as a Dürer print until I researched it. So it was a very exciting find. In the exhibition, there are a few leaves from early scientific texts. For instance, this detailed woodcut looks like a scientific specimen and is immediately identifiable by the modern viewer as a type of fish known as a ray. The author of uh, the book that this came from, Pierre Bellon, was an early naturalist that helped found the discipline of ichthyology, or the study of fish. After studying botany at the University of Wittenberg in 1540, Bellon traveled uh, the Eastern Mediterranean for three years to find in nature what ancient writers had discussed in their texts. Up until around this period, um, uh, people who studied nature would actually just reiterate what ancient writers had written and hadn't, didn't actually go out and to study them in person. So Bellon was one of the first, um, uh, first uh, people to go out and study fish in person. Which is pretty cool. I'll also point out too that it's really neat that at the top the um, words for the identification of the fish are written in multiple multiple languages in Greek and in Latin and in Italian, which means that um, you know it's it's almost like our scientific studies today where you'll use multiple languages to identify um, scientific specimens. The writings of ancient Roman historian Livy were popular in the era of printed of early printed books. Uh, the leaf I'm showing you here is, uh, demonstrates international commerce of the late Middle Ages that the printing press expanded. So what you're actually looking at is a Spanish translation of a Latin text made by a German printer who established a workshop in Spain. So it was extremely international. When you think of today as global economies, well, it's nothing new. I can promise you that. The book was heavily illustrated with scenes of figures in contemporary dress rather than ancient costume. This is not unusual at the time. It's actually a method of emphasizing the lessons to be learned in the narrative that were applicable to the current period. And if you think about it, this is the land, this is the time of colonization and um, empire expansion. So, um, which parallels what the ancient Roman empire was doing. So any lessons that you find in Livy would be very applicable to the, um, Spain as they expand their world um, influence. The power of the printing press cannot be clearer than when considering the impact of Martin Luther. An obscure monk from a small German town, um, in the early 16th century, he launched a major religious revolution known as the Reformation. He was able to spread his thoughts by distributing printing, printed copies of his arguments in small, inexpensive pamphlets written in the everyday language of the people. And so here I've got a picture of Martin Luther next to um, one library's ex, uh, um, collection of pamphlets that he um, produced uh, to, um, to um, I mean, these were basically almost throwaways. So it's pretty amazing that we have so many of them um, still in existence today. His translation of the Bible into German was also widely available in printed editions. I'm showing you here the German New Testament published in 1522 that's at the Library of Southern Methodist University. So most scholars agree that although Luther, before Luther, there were proponents of reforming the corruption in the Catholic Church. I mean, that was nothing new. It was actually Luther who was able to use the new technology of the printing press to share his ideas to great success. So late in his life, Luther's colleagues began the process of compiling, compiling his writings so that they could be easily referenced for study and discussion. The book I'm showing you here is, about, is volume three of four of a version that was produced at the city of um, Jena in Germany, where you, Luther spent a number of years. The title page, which I'm showing on the left, includes a woodcut of two men kneeling on either side of Christ on the cross. At the right is Martin Luther himself, and at the left is his supporter, Frederick III, who was Elector of Saxony, who actually protected Luther when he was excommunicated by the Catholic Church. 
And I also have a picture here of the exterior of the book, which you'll be able to see in, in the gallery, which is probably the original binding, which is pretty neat. It's got some really interesting um, embossed decoration on it. Although Martin Luther is famous for his translation of the Bible into German, other vernacular language editions became available soon after the introduction of printing. So in the museum's collection, we have this uh, 1537 Bible that's actually in Czech. It's the second version printed by the successful Czech printer, Pavel Severin, who first released a version in 1529. There is a seemingly unlikely but exciting connection between our Czech Bible and Martin Luther. So the evocative and original illustrations um, here, actually the page I have open as well as the one, actually we'll go back a second that I'm showing you here is uh, showing the, uh, the story of Samson and Delilah in the book of Job. And I, I kind of show, or excuse me, the book of Judges. And I, had, I have it open to this because not only is it great because it's got two illustrations on, this, on these facing pages so you can um, see two images. Um, with uh, the open book, but also because it's a story that's familiar to a lot of visitors. But what's really neat, like I said, is that we know that the woodcuts that illustrate our Czech Bible were the same woodcuts that illustrated Luther's 1534 complete German Bible. So the page on uh, the left is the page from our Bible of Samson and Delilah. And on the right is um, a, a scan from a, a reproduction of the, the uh, Luther Bible, um, which you can see that the images are exactly the same, even though the one on the right has been hand colored in later. So um, printers would actually often buy and sell illustrations amongst themselves to save time and money. The woodcuts that are in our Bible that were in Luther's German Bible were also used in other Czech editions and we know that it was even used in a Polish Bible and, it, and, right, and now the, um, the original woodcuts are in a uh, collection in Poland. So here are some of the other illustrations that um, some of which you won't be able to see in our Czech Bible but um, just show you how wonderful they are. So uh, this leaf shows how books were actively annotated by their owners. A number of objects in the show have handwritten in comments on the pages. And I just love these. I mean, even though this page isn't super exciting because it doesn't have an illustration, it's not hand colored, it's got all of this, these markings on there. The owner took the time to annotate themselves. I mean, there's really the sense of immediacy that these books were used and studied and loved by their owners. So this one in particular is interesting because it includes something called manicules. So these are hands, you know, now we think of them as like these old fashioned Victorian, um, uh, um, they, they actually became standard text types where you have fingers pointing in all sorts of directions for signage. But originally they were used by um, uh, scholars that were studying their books to, they would draw them in the margins to show this is something important, kind of like, you know, we would use an asterisk or an ar um, arrow today. Um, so these are called manicules. And as you can imagine, that comes directly from the Latin word for hand, uh, manus. And um, uh, you, once you realize what they're supposed to look like, you'll start seeing them all over the place. You'll also notice that this page has um, some holes in it. And here's a, a detail of that. Um, you can see them really well up at the top because the, the holes actually go right through the annotated ink. So these holes are created by insects that burrowed through this book when it was originally bound. Um, so there were a number of sacks of paper. Uh, although a number of uh, types of insects eat dry, starchy paper, they are usually called by the catch-all term bookworm. So now we have bookworm holes in this page. So I've only given uh, you a taste of what's in the exhibition. Uh, there are also leaves from a 1529 copy of uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, a fascinating history of the world commissioned by King Ferdinand of Aragon, who you may have heard of because this is the same King Ferdinand who with his queen uh, Isabella commissioned the explorations of Christopher Columbus and one of the first translations of the Bible into English. Um, I do hope that uh, when the second floor opens that you take the time to come and see them all in person. And I'll have one final note. In researching the leaves of the collection, I've had a fantastic time tracking down digitized versions of the books held in other collections, usually through international library databases like WorldCat. In this way, I've been able to more thoroughly and correctly catalog what we do have. 
because the variations in cataloging vary from library to library, not to mention the issues of dealing with foreign languages. Sometimes it, it took me a few days in, um, to find a digitized copy of the book I was looking for. It was always very exciting when, and when I did, as you can imagine. So I just have to say the ability to do this uh, research remotely is amazing. Only 10 years ago, it would actually require traveling to hundreds of libraries over the world to look at them in person. And somebody like me who's not an expert in the field would never have been able to, um, to do this kind of research. So what's also super exciting is I was able to find a close comparable to almost every object that is on display. Because using a leaf within the context of a complete book is so in, um, important to its meaning and use, I actually refer visitors in the gallery to a blog post on the museum website, will, which will actually go live tomorrow, so you can see them ahead of time. And they have links to all these digitized books. So you can actually page through the books to see um, what, kind, uh, what the entire book would have probably looked like before um, it was uh, disassembled and individual pages put on the market, of which we ended up getting one. Of course, this is never as good as seeing books in person, but at least it uh, hopefully will give uh, you a, a taste of the magical experience of working with this early printed material. So that's where I will end it today. I'm going to stop my, sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Catherine. That You're was welcome. fabulous. Um, I was furiously taking notes because lots oh. of new <laughs> nuggets. I'm going to be ready for an next trivia game too with uppercase and lowercase. <laughs> that's, so, that's only one of many. <laughs> you know, mind your P's and Q's comes from the same, the same tradition. Oh, of course. Oh, because if you think of P's and Q's because all the, 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 the type is backwards, so you could easily mix up your P's and your Q's. So I love it. Oh, that's so fantastic. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I welcome anyone who'd like to put a question in the chat box. Please go for it. I have a couple questions myself, Catherine, while we're waiting. So first of all, I wonder if you wanted to say a little bit more about how you chose what to include. I know this really started two years ago for you. And as you were thinking about what was available in the collection here and in the community with other collectors and how you sort of chose what to have represent mm -hmm. your idea for this exhibition. Um, well, I, I would say that um, it was a multi-step process. I mean, the first thing I did was um, there was some, there was basic cataloging information in our database on these pages, even though they hadn't been researched. I mean, most of them came into the collection in the 20s and the 30s, so uh, they really hadn't had much done with them. But uh, they had come in as um, these portfolios from a, collect, a book collectors club that you could join, and so they had little blurbs on everything. So at least I had some names and some dates to go with. So I identified everything that, that fell into the first century of the printing press and um, took pictures of all of them, started, you know, took the information I had and I, I, I essentially researched all the pages that fell into that first century. And then once I had really good information, um, it was a combination of uh, giving, getting a nice cross section of uh, languages um, subject matter, because I think that's one of the important things I wanted to get across in this exhibition was that, um, you know, there's a wide variety of both. Um, and then uh, some of it was also condition. I mean, um, some of the, the pages, to be honest, were, um, had been folded, unfortunately, to be for storage, and that's how they had shipped them. And so, you know, for a collector that's just unfolding it to look at a page um, and then folding it up and putting it back into storage, it would work, but for us, it would re would have required more treatment to, to get that crease a little bit less, um, uh, um, and, you know, noticeable. Uh, so there were a few pages that way that, um, or even some staining just from the paper that had it, that they had the folios that they had come in. Um, you'll actually see some discoloration from the mounting that they used back in the 20s and the 30s. Um, uh, on the pages that uh, I picked the ones that were a little less obvious. So, um, and then um, I also, there are a few loans. Um, the Book of Luther was actually offered by um, a collector that I know through the Fine Arts Society that said that he had it. And I was like, this is wonderful because we had no Martin Luther related material. And he's such an important part of the story that it fit in perfectly. And then there's also another um, collector uh, who, Miles Vilsky, who um, also lent to the Illuminated Manuscript Show that had some 
uh, beautiful pages that we actually can show double sided in the gallery because they um, have such interesting things on both sides. So um, uh, it's, um, and then of course it was just things that struck my fancy too, you know, I mean, uh, I did love the fact that, um, you know, we do have that one page in English. And actually that's one thing that if I was doing tours in person in the gallery, I would, I, you know, I would challenge people to see without looking at the labels, if you can figure out which page you can read because you can read it. I mean, it's in old English, <laughs> you know, in, um, but it is in English. So, um, which I thought would, would be kind of a, a cool way to connect to people so that they can, they can actually read some of the text, even if you can't read Italian or Spanish or Latin. <laughs> That's great. That is a, that's a good challenge. We can remember to help prompt people when they come visit. Um, and I don't see any other questions yet, but I have another okay. one. Okay. So did you, I know you mentioned the sort of ability to attribute the Durer uh, illustration from based on your research. And I didn't know if there were any other surprises um, that came about. Um. I'm trying to think that, um, I mean, the juror was a huge surprise. Um, and, you know, it was interesting because just to give you a little bit more background on that one, when it, the, the sheet was put in these portfolios and we acquired it, um, I can't remember exactly, but, you know, this was many decades ago, the, the those, um, woodcuts in that book had not been attributed to him. I mean, that was actually, that has only recently, I think even in the last 15, 20 years that those woodcuts have been in the most recent catalog, Raisin A, which is the book that basically lists every single work by an artist. Um, he, it is now accepted as an early work by Durer. Um, so it was only when I started doing research on that particular edition of that book that I realized, oh my goodness, this could actually be a Durer, which, you know, was pretty cool, but it wasn't necessarily through any fault of the people cataloging back in the 20s and the 30s. It was just because we didn't actually know it was just new information. Um, uh, I would say that um, one of the things I, I mean, I do love the, the, um, the, the, um, the law digests. I mean, we have a few pages and I, that of those where, you know, it's just such tiny little font and I can't imagine somebody trying to study this and like go back and forth between the two things and the fact that these printers must have spent so much time laying out that text to make it look beautiful, readable, but then in, and, and usable by the readers. It's, it's such a, it's such a, it must have been such a fascinating process. Um, I, I did love that when I realized that. It's also really kind of neat because the the page from Dante that we have also has commentary in it. And the way they, they did that page is they're much smaller. So you've got um, uh, um, the original po you know, story by Dante, it's in a little rectangle down in the lower left. And then the, the um, commentaries all are around the other two sides. So they did it a very different way, but because it was supposed to be held in your hands, it's a much smaller book so that you can actually, you know, whoever's reading it can, can hold it in their hands. Um, but the Dante also has a fabulous um, a little tiny woodcut illustration. And because the um, artist was trying to get multiple, as much of the story in there as possible, um, our story, our, our image actually has two parts of the story. So Dante um, and Virgil are in there twice. And because of that, he actually labeled a V over Virgil's head. And um, um, I'm trying to remember, let's see. I can't remember how, but they're labeled so that you can see, okay, this is who this is and this is who that is so that there's no confusion over what's going on in the image. And this is this tiny little woodcut, but it speaks volumes. So that was fun. I loved um, to, uh, pulling that, that page apart as well. I love it, that's great. Yeah, those little notations are really special. Um, I, I'm just having this moment of thinking how meta this exhibition is, because as you're describing what a technological advancement early printed books were, also the research tools now available with digitization and sharing of databases and all these things that are making sort of the layers of this story uh, richer and, and uh, easier to tell. Absolutely, it's, yeah. It is a, it a meta moment. It is, know. yeah. Like I said, I would not have been able to do this even 10 years ago, you know, so... Um, it's still time consuming. I mean, not everything is digitized. I can't tell you how many times I would come to a dead end with records and be like, I just can't find a digitized version of this book. Um, 
but more and more gets put out online. So we'll never have everything out there, but yeah, the amount that is available that is so helpful is just, it's just priceless. Libraries are amazing. <laughs> yeah, they are. We love our libraries. They just Thank keep you. Away. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have a couple questions. So Cheryl asks, do any of the pages on display show music? Yes, actually. Um, and of course, now I'm, I'm, I think there is a missile page that has music on it. Um, and that's actually interesting in, in itself because um, as you can imagine, it was tricky to figure out how to get the, the letterpress, the, the type and the image in the same place. So, um, you know, sometimes they would actually hand write the music in. Um, but the one that we have is um, actually a woodcut um, I think this, if I remember correctly, the staff is in black and the letter or the notes are in red. So it would require two printings. Um, but uh, yeah, they would have done the, the actual um, uh, music in woodcut a lot of times. And then the text is done in, um, in letter press, in um, typeset. So, yep, which is pretty cool. That's great. Thank you. And then Gwen asks, are there primary benefactors in the museum's collection of these works or is the collection mostly acquisitions? And then a second part, is our collection digitized? Uh, really good question, um, both of them. Um, like I said, most of the pieces in the, uh, the museum's collection that are in the show came in, in the, the, as part of these portfolios in the, in the 20s and the 30s, um, given by, um, and I, one of the E-lines, and I'm blanking on her first name, but we're not exactly sure if she bought them and gave them to us or gave us the money to buy them. Because this was an early period when we were acquiring lots of works on paper. So we may have become a subscriber and then ended up getting them. Um, we also have a few later purchases um, that were made with acquisition funds, but then also some donors. Um, uh, uh, we have some gifts from the Toward collection that he gave us mostly works on paper, a few paintings um, where uh, that came in in the 90s, I believe. And so um, we have a number of um, printed books of ours paid uh, leaves that he had given us that are on vellum. And that's actually the example. I believe the one I showed was the one that one of the ones they gave us. So um, we don't actively collect a lot. Um, mostly leaves because it's easier for us to show individual pages as if they're framed as works on paper. But like I said, I mean, the, um, the Czech Bible has come in more recently, I believe that um, uh, in the 60s. So, you know, I think people come across things and, um, you know, they could be really hidden treasures. I mean, I had no idea going into to research that Czech Bible that it was going to have these amazing woodcuts um, from that have that um, that history, uh, and actually, it's it's kind of a shame that we don't have the digitized. I would love to digitize our Czech Bible because it is just absolutely gorgeous. Some of those woodcuts, like the one I showed you of Noah's Ark with the rain coming down, and how that artist had to figure out how to make those tiny little lines to show you that it's raining like crazy on a on a piece of, a slab of wood, just amazes me. And then also all those other details. Uh, I, that actually would have been my first choice to have on display, but it, it did not, it was the only image um, on that page and I really wanted to show two. So that's why I chose the Samson Delilah. So yeah, we do not have any of our material digitized. Personally, it would be a great goal to do that someday. A few of the pieces have been photographed and will be on the website. I don't think they're up there quite yet, but they will be, so. That's a goal. I have the I have the Czech Bible digitization on my list of things to do. So if we ever get the opportunity to do something like that, that would be my first choice. Great, thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I don't, oh, one more uh, question. Can you speak to the origins and evolution of fonts in movable type? In European painting was Gothic font the first or were there other inaugural fonts in addition to Gothic? Oh, that's a really good question. And actually, there are specialists in fonts and typeface. I mean, I cannot be an expert in it. But in general, the, um, the typeface evolved directly from the fonts or the, you know, the, the, um, the, that you would use in the handwritten. So if you have something in German, you know, they were traditionally used what we call today black leather letter, which is usually um, considered like a Gothic type, type font. Um, if you were in Italy, 
a lot of times you would see what has now been called Roman or italic font, um, which is what we're more used to reading in our day to day. Now, when at, once you separate out those two different, um, you know, lines of typeface, um, then it all depends on the individual uh, craftsman. I mean, we have um, lots of our fonts today have the names of the person that originally developed it. Even if you go into like your uh, a Word document today and you pick something like um, um, Garamund, that's named after the man who developed that font originally way back when, when he designed the typeface to be cast. I mean, they would actually craft the original um, carved letter that then would be cast in multiple pieces as type. Um, and then what's really neat is that as, you know, typeset became um, a business, you know, uh, um, you could order a whole set of your, um, your type from somebody. And then sometimes you would reorder it again if, you, if it wore down. Or you could sell it to somebody else if you decided, well, this isn't working for me or this other person has a book that they think would work better for it. Um, so yeah, you can actually find books just on the history of, um, of that type of um, um, material, which is fascinating. But one thing I don't go into a whole lot in the show, especially in the earlier printed material, I think that the, the transition from the manuscript was a little bit more what I was interested in. But I'm trying to think of, um, you know, Garamond is one of the ones that um, comes to mind because I actually tend to use that a lot in flyers because I like it because it looks old fashioned. But there are other, um, you know, fonts that that you can use. You can do a search for the name, and you'll figure out. Oh, wow! This has a much longer history than I even realized, which is pretty cool. Great! Thank you so much. I know these factoids are just—they keep going. It's amazing. <laughs> I it wish means, I could remember more off the top of my head. Oh no, my yeah. goodness! No, it's really—it just <laughs> such great um, content, and it's going to be such a wonderful exhibition. Um, some kudos appearing in the chat box oh, uh, for you. all the fascinating asides and um, Elizabeth says font trading, which I love. Oh. So, thank you so much, Catherine. I know I've been walking by the, the gallery. Everything is shrouded right now in the dark uh, to protect from the light, yeah. but we can't yeah. wait to, to have it yeah. open soon.